Our subject is purity, and our text is found in Matthew chapter 5, verse 8. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. The pure in heart will see God in everything. They will see him in every blessing, and they will see him in every sorrow too. They will see him in times of prosperity, and they will see him in times of trial and tribulation. They will see him in the sun that shines through their crystal window panes, and they will see him in the heavy rains that fall upon their shingled roofs. They will see him in the budding of a soft pink rose, and they will see him in the death of a fallen sparrow. In the words of J.C. Edwards, the pure in heart shall see God in the work of creation, in the ordinances of the gospel, in the dispensation of providence, in the day of judgment, and in heaven forever. We understand the workings of the spiritual heart, don't we? We know that purity is one of God's basic biblical principles, and we believe that the pure in heart will see God in everything. But I wonder, do we truly understand the meaning of the word purity? Do we fully understand the importance of purity in our age. Has God's 20th century woman lost the beauty of purity in her life? And as far as that goes, can genuine purity be achieved? And if so, how and what help is available? These are the questions under consideration today, and hopefully the manner in which I answer these questions will cause you to look introspectively and determine for yourself whether or not your heart is genuinely pure in the sight of God. Hopefully this lesson will create an incentive within you to keep your heart so pure that nothing, absolutely nothing, will hinder the refraction and reflection of your spiritual light. Purity prevents problems. It prevents problems in the individual life. It prevents problems in the world. And it prevents problems in the church, too. We are living in a society that is constantly changing. And unfortunately, many of these changes that are taking place are incompatible with Christianity. I'm fully persuaded that Satan himself is responsible for many of these changes. In skillful, crafty, subtle ways, Satan is robbing us of the purity that's rightly ours as children of God. Because of Satan, the world has become an immoral place in which to live. The home is being destroyed, and the church is losing its identity. Never before in the history of America have we had so much freedom freedom to do what we please, when we please, how we please. And never before have we been under so much bondage, bondage to sin, that is. Sin has slipped into our midst like a thief in the night. Female dominance is prevalent today. Morality is outdated. Sexual intimacy is no longer sacred. Pornographic literature, adult TV, X-rated movies, and such like are norm. Drugs have made a preeminent place for themselves. And all of the old-fashioned sins, drinking, smoking, mixed swimming, dancing, gambling, these things are frolicking in the noonday sun. And to add insult to injury, they have made their way into the church. Even in our more conservative congregations where the gospel is preached in its fullness, there are those who willfully break God's moral law. Where does the problem lie? Does it lie in the pulpit? Does it lie in the pew? Does it lie in the leadership? A resounding yes to all three. We are living in a religious age that condones rather than condemns. For fear of being Pharisaic, for fear of being labeled legalistic, for fear of creating guilt complexes, we've shied away from talking about purity. As a result, we have filled our lives with sin and packed our pews with worldliness.
As a result, godly sorrow is at a very low ebb in the church today. I don't know about you, but I think it's time we return to the old school. I think it's time we tread the old paths again. I think it's time we paint sin black again. We need to turn this thing around. We need to get back on the right track. And with God's help, I believe we can do it. And I'd like to think that you believe so too. Purity is important in our age. It's the only way we can make our faith effective. It's the only way we can face the future with hope. It's the only way we can build for ourselves a stronger church. And it's the only way we can create a better world in which to live. Purity in the life of God's woman is a priceless virtue. Without purity, the moral spirit, the moral excellence that's spoken of in Proverbs 31, verses 10 through 31, cannot be achieved. Without purity, woman cannot reach her God-given potential. Without purity, there can be no genuine worth. Who can find a virtuous woman? Her price is far above rubies. I find it interesting that King Lemuel's mother compared the worth of a virtuous woman to the value of a precious red stone, a stone that could be cut to reflect its beauty at every point, a stone that was extremely rare, a stone that was called a ruby. A ruby, the very word itself stirs my heart. A ruby, it was such a costly treasure. Now, the red ruby is still considered a rare and precious gem today, but a pink ruby, which ironically looks red, is of very little value. A woman may think she possesses a red ruby, but her ruby could be a pink one. This was pointed out to me recently by a reputable jeweler in our area. I had gone with one of our daughters to sell a pair of ear studs, which were beautiful to behold. The rubies were a deep, deep shade of red. They had been expertly cut and mounted in exquisite mountings of gold. We thought they were quite valuable. But when the jeweler appraised them, he said, Your rubies aren't a true red. They're what we call pink. If they were a true red, even though they're tiny, I could give you several hundred dollars for them. Because of their imperfect color, however, they have very little value. This jeweler is a lifelong friend of an uncle of mine who's a lawyer in Dallas. And because of the relationship, it pained him to have to tell us this. But nevertheless, he sorrowfully added, I'm afraid your rubies are worthless to me. While standing there listening to the appraisal of our jewels, I thought about the illustration of the rubies in Proverbs 31. And since then, I've been thinking about the virtuous women I've known through the years. To me, some of these women have appeared to be superior as far as their spiritual beauty is concerned. But now I wonder, how will they measure up under the critical eye of the master appraiser. Are they truly virtuous? Are they worthy of honor? Is their price really far above rubies? Or like my daughter's precious looking gems, are they, do they merely appear to be something of genuine worth? And what about my own life? Is it priceless in the sight of God? Am I unusually good, remarkably fine, excellent? Or am I hiding an impure heart beneath a sham of spiritual beauty? Am I a self-centered person? Am I jealous? Am I envious? Am I secretly discontent? Am I a fault finder? Am I harboring a grudge? Am I inwardly angry about something? Let me tell you, ladies, a personal examination 
of your heart can do an awful lot of good. And that's why I challenge you to look introspectively. Determine for yourself whether or not your heart is genuinely pure in the sight of God. And if you find a speck, if you find a flaw of any kind, get rid of it. Remove it quickly. Delete it from your life. Strive to keep your heart as pure as humanly possible because you know not the hour when the master appraiser will come. Jesus tells us this in his own words, Matthew chapter 24, verse 42. Purity is a unique quality that sets God's woman apart from the rest of the world. Purity is what makes God's woman sparkle. It's that magic ingredient that makes her radiantly beautiful. It's something that can be seen in every aspect of her life. It can be seen in her thoughts and her words and her deeds and her actions. Even her attitudes will just naturally reflect the love which she has for Christ. As women, we usually judge the beauty of another woman by outward appearance, don't we? The plaiting of hair, the wearing of gold, the putting on of apparel, these things are so important to us. And if we meet a woman who sparkles, we just naturally chalk it up to the fact that God gave her an extra measure of natural beauty. Not so. Not so at all. A woman who sparkles is a woman who has opened her heart and allowed God to brush it with a stroke of purity. External beauty deserves no praise unless matched with the inner virtues that she has developed because of her love for God, because of her love for Christ. That which is inside the package, not the wrapping, makes the worth of the gift. And you know this as well as I. Woman's beauty does not lie in an elaborate hairstyle expensive jewelry and fancy clothing, but rather in the goodness of her heart, in the gentleness of her soul, in the sweetness of her character. God's inspired word tells us that the true beauty of womanhood is purity. First Peter chapter 3 verses 1 through 6 is proof positive of this fact. And now, for that inevitable question, has God's 20th century woman lost the beauty of purity in her life? That's a hard one, isn't it? And before trying to answer the question, I want us to read a passage of scripture together. First Peter, no, nope, excuse me, First Timothy chapter 2 verses 9 and 10. Now in this passage of scripture, Paul is writing to the young preacher Timothy, and he is explaining how men and women should act when they assemble for worship. In verse 8, he's been talking to the men, and now he turns his attention to the women, and he says, I will, therefore, that the women adorn themselves in modest apparel, with shamefacedness and sobriety, not with braided hair or gold or pearls, but with good works which becometh women professing godliness. Now, in the immediate context of this passage, Paul is talking about first century Christians who were overdressing when they assembled for worship. As far as God's woman was concerned, a great emancipation had just taken place. Before the church was established, a Jewish woman who came to worship in the synagogue was kept out of sight in a carefully screened gallery. There was no such custom of seclusion in the church, however, and apparently some of these early day Christian women were claiming an unhealthy freedom in their newfound liberty. You see, these women lived in a heathen city where the priestesses of the temple were notoriously immoral. The priestesses of the temple braided gold and jewels into their hair, and they wore expensive clothing. And for Christian women to assemble themselves arrayed in costly attire with flowers of gold and pearls braided into their hair was neither healthy for themselves 
nor for the church. For in the eye of the public, they would be like the immoral women of the temple. And therefore, Paul is instructing the young preacher Timothy to reason with these early day sisters of ours regarding their responsibility as far as honorable appearance is concerned. In essence, he was saying, remind the godly women, Timothy, not to call undue attention to themselves. He said, by the manner of dress, they are casting a, an impure light on themselves and on the church. Tell them to let the, the world see them by their good works and not by the manner in which they dressed. Now, do you think this sounds familiar? Could Paul have been echoing the words of Christ in Matthew chapter 5, verses 14 and 16? Well, I think so. And I also think that it's a message that needs to be echoed today. Anytime a woman dresses in such a way as to call undue attention to herself, she is immodestly dressed. A woman who dresses improperly for a specific occasion, be it public worship or any other public event, is like a candle that's been put under a basket. No way is she going to shine to all that are in the house. And just like these first century Christians, we're living in an age when God's women seem to delight in dressing like the women of the world. We are appearing more and more in public with less and less on, solemnly affirming that it's fashionable to do so. I believe that the newfound freedoms that we enjoy in the church today have caused us to blend with the world. And as a result, we are losing our identity as godly women. Now, what can we do about this? What can we do? Well, maybe it would help if each one of us were to let a little bit of Vashti's blood flow through our veins. Vashti's story is found in the book of Esther, chapter 1. Vashti was not a woman of God, but even so, she's a woman whom we can emulate when it comes to this matter of modesty. Vashti was a queen who valued her modesty over her crown. And because of this, she found an immortal place in the Word of God, immortality. Immortality. Now, ladies, that's what we should be striving for. Strange as it may seem, the purity of our hearts can either be seen or hidden by the manner of dress. I plead with you. Let your purity shine through. Let it shine like a candle that's been set on a candlestick to give light to all that's in the room. Let it help dispel the darkness of sin that's in the world. Dress modestly. Strive for immortality. Purity is a reasonable price to pay for eternity in heaven. And that's why I beseech you by the mercies of God that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Study scriptures like James 1.27, 1 Thessalonians 5.22, Romans 12.1 and 2, Proverbs 1 and 10, and apply these biblical truths to your life. Give God your entire life. Crush your self-willed desires. Totally commit yourself to the cause of Christ. Be obedient to his moral law. Rid yourself of impurity. Keep yourself unspotted from the world. Abstain from the very appearance of evil. Be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable will of God. Don't let the world squeeze you into its mold. If sinners entice thee, consent thou not. Wrong is wrong even if everyone else is doing it. But right is right even if no one else is doing it. And I hope you'll latch on to this truth and help me wave it like a flag for all to see. Wrong is wrong even if everyone else is doing it.
But right is right even if no one else is doing it. First time I've ever had an amen, <laughs> a verbal amen. But, but the surest way to lose favor with the Lord is to seek favor with the world. And we need to keep this uppermost in our mind. One little willful sin is enough to ruin the purity of an entire heart. A little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. A little leak can sink a boat. A little scorpion can sting a lion to death. A little worm can kill a tree. A little match can burn a forest. Gangrene can spread from the toe to the foot from the foot to the leg, from the leg to the thigh, and from the leg, uh, from the thigh to the vital parts. The most poisonous serpent on the face of the earth at first was but a harmless looking little egg. Beware of little sins. They'll get you if you don't watch out. To illustrate the severity of harmless looking little sins, I'd like to tell you about an old, old radio song. Now, I don't know the title, and neither do I know the exact words, but the story goes like this. On a cold, icy morning, a woman found a snake lying frozen in her garden. Feeling sorry for the snake, she picked it up, carried it into the house, and laid it by the fire to warm. And warm it did. When it thawed, it bit her. And as she lay dying, she asked, why? Why did you do this to me? And forcefully, the snake replied, you knew I was a snake when you brought me in. Need I say more? Sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death, James 1, 15. Purity, how precious it is in the sight of God. Purity is such a small price to pay for so great a reward. And a little impurity is such a high price to pay for the loss of one's soul. Purity in the life of God's woman is important. Woman holds a place of honor in God's great scheme of things. She holds a place of power. She's the hub around which her God-given sphere revolves. She's the influencing factor of her home. She's the one who sets the rhythm for her family unit. And like ripples of a pebble that has been dropped into a pool of water, the influence of her life will be farther reaching than its initial impact. Vibrations of the rhythm will be felt in the church and in the community and in the world and in eternity. Now, I think that Timothy's mother Eunice and his grandmother Lois are good illustrations of this. The influence they had on Timothy stretched far beyond the threshold of their home, didn't it? Only one verse in the Bible tells the beautiful story of these two godly women. But what a story it is. In 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 5, Paul speaks of Timothy's unfeigned faith, and he makes mention of the fact that Timothy's unfeigned faith was first seen in the lives of his mother and his grandmother. And even though the recorded story is short, can't you just hear Lois and Eunice as they talk to Timothy, as they talk to him about love and joy and peace and righteousness and purity? As they talk, when they sit within their house, when they walk by the way, when they lay down at night, when they rose up in the morning as they had been commanded by the law. Beyond a shadow of a doubt, Eunice and Lois taught Timothy to live the way God would have him live out of a deep-rooted love for godliness. Think of how strong the church would be today if 20th century mothers and grandmothers would emulate the lives of Eunice and Lois, think of the influence we would have upon the world. Now, in a back issue of 20th century Christian magazine, Jim Bill McIntyre published an article entitled, And His Mother's Name Was Abijah. 
in the article, Brother McIntyre tells of the influence that Abijah had on her son. Abijah lived in the days of the kings. She was married to a king, and she gave birth to a king. And as you know, some of the Old Testament kings were good, and some of them were bad. Abijah's husband was an evil king, but her son was a good king. The story is recorded in Second Chronicles chapter 29, verses 1 and following. And this is the way it reads. Hezekiah began to reign when he was five and twenty years old. And he reigned nine and twenty years in Jerusalem. He set the house of the Lord in order. And his mother's name was Abijah. And his mother's name was Abijah. Now, Brother McIntyre's comment regarding the mention of Abijah's name in the record is this. That's not accidental. That's not just biographical. That's more than lineage listing. It's directly connected with the blessed end result. Hezekiah was a godly king because he was raised by a godly mother. And Brother McIntyre inserted a personal comment that caused tears to surface when I first read it. He made an application of his mother's life to that of Abijah. Fifty-four years before the writing of the article, his mother had made an entry in his baby book, which read, Today, for the first time, Bill said Jesus. More important to her than when her son took his first step. More important than when he said his first word. More important than when he first said daddy was the day that she taught him to lisp Jesus. Oh, mothers. Oh, grandmothers. What a marvelous testimony for us to hear in our age. What a marvelous example for us to follow. And his mother's name was Abijah. Purity must be taught, and the teaching must be specific. Vague generalities just won't do. Impurity is a serious thing in the mind of God. And now, if you doubt this, you haven't read your Bible. You haven't read the Old Testament, and neither have you read the New. Under both dispensations of time, God has laid down some very specific laws regarding this matter of purity, and he expects them to be obeyed. Surprising as it may seem, God in his infinite wisdom has placed a large portion of the teaching responsibility in the hands of a woman. Titus 2 verses 3 through 5 tells us that the older women are to teach the younger women to be discreet, to be chaste, to be pure. Personally, I feel that Paul's instructions were to mothers and to grandmothers, and I also think that the teaching should be done on a one-to-one -one basis. And I think that in turn, the younger women should teach their daughters the things that they have learned from the older women. Now, I'm not advocating that classroom instruction be deleted from our teaching program. I'm merely saying that the teaching must start early in life, long before a young woman becomes a wife and a mother. She needs some how-to instructions. She needs some specific guidelines. She needs some rules. She needs some regulations in order to become the wife and the mother that God wants her to be. And incidentally, sons need specific regulations and guidelines and rules in order to become the fathers and the husbands that God expects them to be. We went through a period of time in our family when we laid down a new rule every week for our children to follow. Thou shalt not lie. Thou shalt not cheat. Thou shalt not steal. And usually these rules rose out of a specific need for a specific age or stage that our children were in.
As the children grew older, we started making the rules before the problems arose. Thou shalt not drink. Thou shalt not smoke. Thou shalt not dance. Thou shalt not fool around with drugs. Now, some of the rules were specifically for the girls and others were specifically for the boys. Girls, thou shalt keep yourselves sexually pure. Thou shalt not sleep with a man before your wedding night. And boys, thou shalt keep yourselves sexually pure. Thou shalt not place yourself in a position where you might reach the point of no return. You know, for every unwed mother, there is an unwed father out there somewhere in the world. And it seems that the sexual drive within the male is stronger than the sexual drive within the female. And I'm fully convinced within my own heart that if mothers would start talking to their sons, we wouldn't have so many teenage pregnancies. So mothers, I encourage you, those of you who have sons, talk to them about this serious matter. One day, they will suffer the consequences, if not now, then in eternity. Well, on and on I could go as far as our rules are concerned. We had specific rules for everything. Table rules, car rules, church building rules, TV viewing rules, book reading rules. And much to the dismay of our older daughter, the dating stage ushered in curfew rules, and the curfew was 10 o'clock. And we never changed the hour. The second the, and the third and the fourth child, the curfew was 10 o'clock. You know, I couldn't go to sleep until those children came in, and I couldn't stay awake much longer than 10. And so I set the curfew for my own good. Now, our dress code was strict, and it still is. Despite the fact that we were warned by others that our preaching methods were, our parenting methods were too strict, Despite the, we did do a lot of preaching. Despite the fact that our children were preacher's kids, they turned out pretty good. But I will be the first to admit that they're warped in a few spots. They really are. But they're all faithful to God, and for this we're grateful. Let me tell you about one more rule, and then we'll move on to the next point. Years ago, when the children were still little, we made a rule that stands to this day, and that rule is this. The first one to get to heaven saves everyone else a place. And now that we're growing older, this seems to be the best of all the rules we made. Because you see, this is the rule that continues to keep our hearts in tune with one another. And this is the rule that continues to keep our hearts in tune with God. We plan to have a family reunion in the presence of God someday. And hopefully, you're planning to have one too. The word heart, as used in the Bible, refers to one's innermost nature. This has been pointed out by almost every speaker that has stood in this pulpit this week. A good woman out of the good treasure of her heart bringeth forth good things, but an evil woman out of the evil treasure of her heart bringeth forth evil things. Your heart can love, Deuteronomy 6, 5, or it can hate, Leviticus 19, 17. Your heart can rejoice, Psalms 33, 21, or it can grieve, Genesis 6, 6. Your heart can be upright, Psalm 64, 10, or it can be evil, Jeremiah 7, 24. As a woman thinketh in her heart, so is she, Proverbs 23, verse 7. Your heart is the determinant factor by which you'll be judged someday. Would you like to go to that beautiful place called heaven? Would you like to pass through those beautiful gates of pearl? 
Would you like to walk down that beautiful street of gold? Would you like to hear the harpers harping on their heavenly harps someday? Would you like to feast upon that stately mansion that Christ is preparing for you? Would you like to see the angels bowing before the majestic throne of God? Would you? Well, if so, you're going to have to keep yourself physically, spiritually, mentally, and morally pure. That's the message of the Bible. How can purity be achieved? What help is available? Well, I suppose we could work our way through the Bible from Genesis to Revelation, snip out bits and pieces of related subject matter, put it all together, and come up with a pretty good game plan for achieving purity. The danger I see in this, however, is that we might end up creating a semblance of purity in our lives and fail to cultivate a deep-rooted set of principles as far as purity is concerned in our hearts. We might become morally good, but fail to become genuinely pure. Genuine purity is the prerequisite for heaven, and we must always keep this uppermost in our mind. Now, it seems to me that the most simple, the most safe, the most sensible thing to do is to turn our backs on the world. Take Christ by the hand and allow him to lead us to heaven. Christ is our example of purity. He is our hope of eternal life. Now, since he is our example, why not let him be our guide? Since he is our hope, why not let him be our help? If we really believe that Christ is our example, we will pattern our lives after his. We will think like he thinks and we will act like he acts. If we believe that Christ is our hope, we will strive to be like him. We will try to keep ourselves pure. This is the message of 1 John chapter 3, verse 3. I wonder how long has it been since you've studied or as far as that goes even read 1 John chapter 3, verses 1 through 3. If you haven't read this passage, I suggest that you do it real soon because 1 John 3, chapter, uh, chapter 3, verses 1 through 3, is a commentary on Matthew chapter 5, verse 8. It not only tells us why we should keep ourselves pure, it also tells us how. In this passage of Scripture, we learn about the love that God has for us and the relationship that we have with Him. God is our Heavenly Father. We are His children. Now, we can't fully understand the mystery of this relationship. We can't fathom the depth of God's love that brought us into this relationship. As far as that goes, we can't even visualize what it's going to be like when we get to heaven. But we know from reading this passage that we're going to be like Christ if we keep ourselves pure. It's difficult to achieve purity in our age because the world places a, lo a lot of pressures upon us. And in this passage of scripture, John affirms this. He affirms the fact that the, the world doesn't recognize us. The world does not understand us. The world does not appreciate us. As far as that goes, they don't the world, that is, doesn't understand, doesn't recognize, doesn't even appreciate God. And that's why it places pressure upon us. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life gets in our way. But we can't let the love of the world hinder us. We can't pattern ourselves after the world. If the love of the world is in us, if we become like the world, then the love of the Father is not in us, and we won't be able to, to uh, become like Christ. The world passeth away, and the lust thereof, but he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. We must not let the pleasures of the world deter us. 
Because of the hope that lies within us, we must strive to keep ourselves pure. Genuine purity must be our earthly goal if heavenly hope is to become a reality. Now, I'm sure that you aren't able to see the table at the front of the room from back on those back rows, but I'd like to call your attention to it anyway. The word purity, which I've placed on the table, is a wooden acrostic which uh, illustrates the main points of the lesson. I wanted to build the acrostic as I built the lesson, but wired up like I am, I couldn't do that. And so I'm just simply going to call your attention to it, and I'd like to use it um, in order to summarize what we have talked about in this lesson today. The letter P stands for the word priceless. Purity is a priceless virtue. The word um, unique comes next. U stands for unique. Purity is a unique quality that sets God's woman apart from the rest of the world. R stands for reasonable. Purity is a reasonable price to pay for heaven. I stands for important. Purity is important in the life of God's woman. T stands for taught. Purity must be taught. Y stands for your heart. Your heart is the determinant factor by which you'll be judged someday. Purity is a choice. The choice is yours to make and yours alone. Do I unwire myself? <laughs> <laughs>